Alrighty, welcome and hello. Uh, welcome to the Gumshoe Podcast. Uh, with you here, uh, you have uh, Jake Webb and Chad Corner. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm Jake Webb, uh, both uh, of PPM TV. Chad, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Chad Corner from PPM TV. All right, and wonderful. We also have Roxy Zwicker here uh, from PPM TV. Roxy Zwicker is also with us. Hello, Roxy. Roxy might be on mute right now. That's all right. Gr- greetings to all, to all gumshoes out there. There you go. R- Roxy, can you turn your video on? Um, I, I will momentarily. Okay, no worries. great. Um, yeah, um, we're just going to be talking a little bit about, uh, I mean, the, this podcast, we uh, investigate the, the, the paranormal, the supernatural, the abnormal. Um, and uh, Chad and I are... Um, not necessarily qualified experts um so that's why we bring in uh very qualified uh interesting guests um so today we have with us nomar slevik hey nomar how's it going hey good thanks so much for having me on happy to have you yeah so nomar has written um several books uh regarding uh ufos aliens and the like um including granite skies otherworldly encounters and ufos over maine um Nomar, talk a little bit about, like, how, how'd you get started with aliens and UFOs? Uh, sure. So that started a long time ago. Uh, it was the early 80s. I was, like, four years old, and I think I saw something strange. I, um, I uh, was living in Fort Kent, Maine at the time, uh, which is at the tip of Maine. You can throw a rock and hit Canada. And I had fallen asleep, and a loud bang woke me up in the middle of the night. And uh, so my eyes popped open and I wasn't sure what it was. So I was kind of like looking around for an explanation and I started hearing taps at the window. So I looked and the sky started lighting up and I'm like, oh, it's a thunder and lightning storm. So at four years old, I was like, sweet. You know, so I knelt up and started looking out the window and uh, basically right under the window is the St. John River. And it was just roaring, you know, very... uh, rough rough waters and after a moment i saw this this is how my mind still remembers it a lightning bolt got stuck in the clouds and like if i were to ask you to draw a lightning bolt you would draw like this jagged yellow line you know where it kind of looks like uh, the charging indicator on your smartphone and that was stuck in a cloud and even at four years old i knew that you only saw lightning for a split second so I'm watching it and there's like electricity coming off of it and there's booms associated with it. And uh, I, I'm not really sure what happened next other than falling asleep. I woke up the next morning and I went to the bathroom and I was going back to my room and walking back to my room, you can see out my windows and the lightning bolt was still there. No way. Yeah. And I thought it was really odd but you know i wasn't thinking ufo or anything i'm just like why is the lightning bolt still in the sky so i ran downstairs to get my dad brought him all the way upstairs to look out my window and when we got there it was gone and i was like you know i was kind of freaking out and i was really excited and i was trying to tell him what i saw and he was doing like the you know the 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 young father thing like patting me on the head be like yeah 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 but I must have been very animated because he had to like kneel down, put his hands on my shoulders and get on my level. And I was like, hey, buddy, it didn't even rain last night. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. So um, being that I was like four years old, you know, something shiny caught my attention and I forgot all about it. A couple of weeks later, I'm being woken up again in the middle of the night. But this time it's my dad waking me up. And I say the middle of the night, but, you know, four years old is at 9 p.m. or 3 a.m. Like, you know, I don't know. But uh, he brings me downstairs and I can see that my mom is like shoving my sister into her like snow jacket and ski pants and stuff. And then she starts doing the same thing to me. And then my dad picks me up and we go outside, (laughs) you know, and I don't know what's going on. So it's super cold. So I stick my head in my dad's chest and he keeps telling me to look up, look up. You got to see this. Look up. So I look up and there's like this kaleidoscope or like ribbons of lights and I'm seeing the Northern Lights. And it's the only time I've ever seen them. And it's, you know, I can remember them like yesterday. So those two things happening so close to each other, I think created some sort of core memory or something. And like weird stuff 
happens in the sky and I should pay attention. And that was the, you know, inadvertent catalyst to paying attention and wanting to know about all things strange. And it just kind of kept snowballing, you know, like 10 years old, 12 years old, uh, really into like watching unsolved mysteries and horror movies. My mom got me into horror movies way too young. <laughs> and, uh, and it kept snowballing and uh, there was a uh, uh, an unsolved mysteries about a ufo encounter that happened in maine and i was like what this can happen anywhere this happened in my state and it actually happened just a couple of hours south from where i was living at the time oh my god yeah so it really surprised me and i just kept this keen interest in the paranormal and uh ufos specifically or especially really uh, that in my teen years, late teens and early 20s, I was just collecting tons of stories. And that was like clipping news articles that I would find in the local paper. I would ask friends and family if they'd ever had a sighting or even if they'd seen a Bigfoot or UFO or any you know, a ghost or anything, you know. And um, during that time, I was also expanding my own personal library of paranormal books and you know if you're a connoisseur of new england paranormal books and you know there's a couple of authors you know on the show right now uh, where we are connoisseurs of it there's just a plethora of ghost books and i was looking at my shelf one day and there wasn't a book that covered the ufo topic in maine like solely there were some books like The Supernatural Side of Maine by author C.J. Stevens, an amazing book, but it has a gamut of stories, ghosts, Bigfoot, uh, werewolves, and also UFOs. But again, not a book that covered UFOs solely. And I, I had the dumb thought that I was going to write that book. And uh, after way too many years, it finally got done. And uh, that was the first book that uh, I got published, and that was 2014. So. Awesome. And which so book a long was story that? longer. I'm sorry? Which book was that? That was UFOs Over Maine. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's wild. Um, Chad and I were talking a little bit before uh, coming on the show here. We were we were just kind of trying to figure out what we were going to talk about today. Um, and uh, I asked Chad if he'd ever seen... Um, my, I mean, my, my obvious follow-up was going to be, have you ever seen a UFO? And it seems like that... Uh, encounter at four years old i don't know it's it's something yeah. strange you it's saw something, something weird yeah. um and i actually don't remember what your answer to that was if um, you've ever seen anything weird yeah my my answer was uh, I, I don't think i've ever seen anything that stood out to me um you know up in the air but i've seen things that i you know it looks strange i mean there's certainly things that like you kind of can tell what a plane looks like up in the sky you yeah. can kind of tell what you know, if, if a bat or something like that's flying up above and it's an animal, like you can kind of yeah. tell something that, but I, I've definitely seen things that I, I don't, I don't, it just looks, it looks out of the ordinary. It looks weird. It's strange. And it's very high up and it not satellites. I wouldn't think it would be satellites. I used to live out in uh, central mass um, for a little bit and you could see so many stars and you could see all these satellites passing by all the time. And I would sometimes see things that were like, they weren't as bright as satellites, but they looked like there was something moving in the sky. I don't know what that would be, um, but I've never seen anything that's like specifically like strange like that, like a, a, like a lightning bolt. I've never yeah. seen anything that really stuck with me. And, and when, I, when I think back about that now, you know, I'm just wondering if that's how my young mind like perceived it or morphed it into, or was there a screen memory thing happening? I mean, that's a whole nother you know ball yeah. wax, but but uh, uh but yeah i'm just wondering if that's like how my young mind interpreted it for you know whatever reason yeah i mean well but that's it's funny because like i have memories from you know that age and you're describing that so vividly um and you clearly remember that so intensely which i, I don't know that that lends some um I, I, I don't know a, a degree of believability to that that like sure. I, I, I don't know it's it's convincing to me um, I have not I, I haven't seen anything that I would definitely call a UFO but I've um, driven back and forth across New Mexico several times um, and in the wee hours of the night there's a lot of weird unexplained lights happening 
in the desert sky. Um, so, which is, yeah, similarly, just stuff that you can't really, don't really have an explanation for. But, um, and I mean, of course, New Mexico is fun because it, it wasn't, uh, it was closer to Albuquerque than Roswell, but still. Yeah. But you say yeah. New Mexico and people think. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, have you ever been out that, that way? I haven't, no, no. but uh, I'd love to sometime. Yeah. So your, um, your experience is all uh, New England based. Yeah. Uh, have you ever like searched for stuff? You mean like gone out into the field? Yeah. 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 So with my books, you know, it's not just, you know, armchair quarterbacking. I'm going out and I'm interviewing people as, as much as people are comfortable. That's, they're not always comfortable. And um, sometimes it's a phone call, which is okay. I'd prefer a face-to-face meeting, but sometimes it's like just through email or like uh, messaging service through, you know, Facebook or Instagram or something like that. Cause that's how most comfortable they prefer to communicate. And even if I do conduct what I think is an extensive interview at the end of it, or a few weeks later, or a few months later, they might contact me and be like, you know what, don't use my story, (laughs) you know, and I'm like, okay. And that's, you know, I'm here for the witness, like the biggest thing for me is being a non judgmental kind ear for somebody that's experienced something really crazy. And um, there's a lot of trauma unexpected trauma that can come from that a lot of people don't have an outlet for it and i too have my own trauma but the catalysts were not extraterrestrial or the paranormal it was you know things that happened in my childhood or you know and uh, and so i can struggle with depression and anxiety and even suicidal ideation sometimes and an experiencer can also experience those things and to be able to understand them on a symptomatic level almost endears us to each other and i can listen uh, as unbiasedly as i can to them because i'm not asking them to prove anything to me i just want them to tell me what happened and hopefully i'm privileged enough that they let me share it so have I gone out and searched? Absolutely. I've gone to people's property where things have happened. It's almost like the police. It's very reactive. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like you get a phone call and and it might have happened in the 70s or it might have happened two weeks ago, you know. And um, uh, But one uh, in the field situation that I found myself in, I was at a military uh, Air Force base, but it is uh, since closed down. But there were lots of exciting encounters that happened in 1975 and in the 60s. There's actually been a lot of stuff since the base had been open. And it closed, I think, officially in 94. So I was over there in 2017. And um, I stopped at the local cop shop and I was like, yo, I'm going to be on the base at like three in the morning. So just an FYI, you know, if somebody reports, you know, a weirdo yeah. <laughs> on the runway, it's, it's me. And uh, they were like, you know, what are you doing? And I explained, and they're like, okay, that's cool. So I'm at uh, Loring Air Force Base in Northern Maine in 2017. And I'm sitting on the runway. And the runway, it's like two miles of uh, unobstructed road. Like during the day, you can just like get going 100 miles an hour, (laughs) you know, down the road because there's nothing there, you know, it's really cool. And, uh, but it's, you know, it's like 2 or 3 a.m. And, there had been drizzle all night. So there's a low cloud cover and I'm sitting as best as I can on the runway where an experience happened in 1975 on the base. That experience was a UFO being seen on radar at first. And then there was visual uh, observation of the craft. And so many people saw it, in fact, that the wing commander of the base observed it with his eyes and he was the highest commanding officer on base that night and he witnessed it and it all sort of culminated where the ufo disappeared and then it reappeared over the runway and it was hovering just about five feet above the runway oh my god so main state police and military police were kind of converging on the runway to like confront whatever the hell this thing is so they get to about you know, a hundred yards away from it and they all park and they get out and they're just watching this football shaped object hovering above the runway. And it's been described by some of the soldiers that were there or some of the MP officers as like plasma going 
over this weird shape, you know, this oval shape. And they don't know what to do. They're just watching it. <laughs> and hopefully, you know, they don't get hit by a ray beam, you know, or something. <laughs> so they're just watching it and kind of looking at each other. And then it blinks out. 10 seconds later, their radios come on and it's the tower saying that the object is now over Nova Scotia. You know, and that's quite a ways away. Yeah. Wow. So that that's just one little tiny part of that incident that happened that night. So I am at this area of the runway in 2017, as close as I can approximate to where this occurred. And I've got an uninstructed view of the sky. And my head's like on a swivel, you know, I'm just like watching for anything. With the low cloud cover, whatever I'm gonna see isn't gonna be celestial because it would have to be under the clouds, you know? Yeah. Or at least that's my hope. So I'm watching and I'm waiting and nothing's happening and nothing's happening. And I actually scare myself at one point because <laughs> I had gotten out and I heard something, but it ended up being my windshield wipers. It freaked me out. But anyway, <laughs> so I had sat there for about an hour in the dark and I was like, okay, I got to go someplace else. So I go to the parking lot of the watchtower. And they also had visual confirmation at the watchtower, not to mention on radar as well. So I'm in the parking lot of the watchtower. And now I, my view of the sky is obstructed. I've got the watchtower kind of in front of me. But other than that, it's unobstructed. So I'm kind of looking around and looking around. And I'm there not even five minutes. And boom, there's a light in the sky. And it's just like to the right of the, of the watchtower, but higher. You know, it's probably, you know, 300 feet above that, but under the clouds still. Wow. And it's just like this, I don't know, this this ball of light. And, uh, I, you know, I'm a researcher and I'm a writer and, and an investigator, quasi-investigator. And I'm very human in that moment. I'm just having the experience and I'm just looking at it. And right next to me is like a parabolic mic, night vision camera, you know, I've got some gear next to me and I'm just watching it like an idiot. <laughs> and I look, I look down and I'm holding my cell phone. <laughs> so I turn on the camera of my cell phone and start holding the cell phone up and I'm recording the light. And then I'm like, I know drive under it. So that's what I do. I put the car in drive. It was already running. I just put it in drive and I started to move. And as I started to move to get underneath it, the light does this weird loop-de-loop -loo thing and blinks out. And I caught all of it on camera. And you can watch it on my YouTube channel. It's, um, it sounds more impressive than it, than it is, but. All right, I'm sorry for the grainy video, but uh, I am by the, uh, the radar tower. As you can see, there's a, there's a light in the sky right there. It's not moving. I'm gonna head towards it. Okay, whoa. And it's gone. Okay you know, to put like the things that happened in the 50s, 60s and 70s uh, into the 80s at that base. And then I go there in 2017 and I also have an encounter, you know, in the same area, you know, putting it all together, it, it was pretty impactful. Yeah. You know, a, a skeptic will look at it and be like, well, it is an unexplained light. We don't know what it's from. It is under the cloud cover, but it could be anything. And you know what? They're right. It could be, but it was a hovering light. And then it did this weird thing and then it blinked out. Yeah. So, you know, that was an experience I had out in the field and that didn't freak me out like my windshield wipers from earlier. <laughs> I was just, I was awestruck. And frankly, while this is what you hope for, I, you know, you can't, you're never ready for it, you know, so. Do you, in any part of your mind, did you think it was military owned? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it was a like special... Um, technology that w like the common prototype person, yeah, drone or something, drone yeah. or something. Because if you look at drones nowadays, it they do look like if they're moving in the sky, they can move so quickly, and that's like so a quickly. consumer 
product that we can use. And yeah. I mean, since the atom bomb was dropped, obviously Roswell, all this stuff became in, insane. And you've heard, I've heard stories of over war zones that they, they see these similar objects that you're saying, like these little spherical like objects that are in that, that aren't anyone's. They're, they're no no militaries that yeah. we know of, right? Um, that we know of. That right. they're observing what's going on. And, and then the fact that it's over a military base and you're experiencing yeah. this, yeah. I just can't imagine if it's some some sort of... I'm, I'm the believer that I don't believe a, a biological creature is inside of those things. I think it's technology that they sure. potentially may That's be fair. using yeah. um, because why would they use the resources to carry their biological body to another planet when like what we do we take we go and take pictures of like mars and the moon and and stuff like that i feel like if there was something out there that they would do the same thing and this this might be one of those types of i don't know yeah i I completely agree that is plausible and a similar scenario ran through my mind i can't say that ran through my mind in the moment but when i was watching the footage back at my hotel room later on i was like oh could that have been a drone or a helicopter and or some other sort of uh, advanced military vehicle that maybe is silent because there was no sound and uh, yeah all of that ran through my mind i then did some manipulation of the video Uh, to try to like brighten it up and uh, you know inverted it and it looks weird and that's also part of the YouTube video where you can see those those things that I did with it just to try to catch what it looks like even better and and if it is a drone it's a weird futuristic robot looking thing you know but is it possible yes it doesn't mean it's extraterrestrial and even though I'm a researcher and I and I put out books and a podcast and do and documentaries, I do all this stuff that has to do with UFOs, doesn't always mean it's extraterrestrial. That acronym has become synonymous with UFO. It's a, a, one of the few reasons UAP came out of UFO to take that stigma away from it. You know, what is UAP? So, UAP is unidentified aerial phenomena. Oh, okay, yeah. and that can be literally anything yeah as long as it's unidentifiable and aerial so but with ufo it's just synonymous with alien but what i saw that night i don't know if it's extraterrestrial it could have been the same thing that people were seeing at loring you know 40 years earlier but uh you know much more close up you know i don't know what it was but in the same logical process of thinking that that you were talking about um if that was the case that it was something military or it was drone but military or something to that effect why is it at a defunct base mm-hmm. looking at some idiot exactly. on the runway at you know 2 a.m that yeah. doesn't make yeah. sense to me yeah you know what's interesting though is um the department of defense does have a whole set of offices there it's really? on the peripheral okay. of the base the peripheral of the base actually has some businesses there there's a job corps school there um, there's the Department of Defense has administrative offices there. Uh, there's a museum, you know, for like when Loring w- w- was uh, alive. But they haven't done a whole lot with the actual base itself. Mm-hmm. But on the peripheral, that Department of Defense administrative building is there. And um, it's, it, and it's sorry, it's a financial administrative office. So it is certainly possible that the funds that went to um, um, fund the uh, the <laughs> sorry the u.s government's ufo studies could have gone through that building you know at some point yeah and uh so that's really interesting to think about and that's the only reason i think that it could be something actively military that's there because that department of defense uh, financial administrative offices are there yeah but other than that it doesn't make sense because you've got you know a school <laughs> you know in a museum and then it's just very very rural so yeah while it could be military, it just doesn't make sense why they would be there at two AM, especially when I'm exactly. there waiting for this to happen. <laughs> yeah, that seems yeah. that seems like yeah, it's it, it would be like, a poor planned thing at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And and maybe almost as wild as it actually being aliens or an alien probe of some sort. Yeah. You right. know, like they, they Yeah. Even you know, it's it's interesting to think about. No, absolutely. And that's and that's super interesting, just that whole story. Um because the the fact that 
I mean, I've never heard of this. Have you ever heard about this the this this phenomenon at this base before? I've never no. even yeah, I've never heard anything about it. Granted, again, we're we're not uh, licensed professionals, but <laughs> um, it, it's just interesting because that seems like you know, like the way you're describing it, that original instance had a lot of people witnessing it, yeah. and you'd think that you know. And up close too. I mean, you said it was like five feet off the ground. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah um, it's ridiculous. And there's actually a book written about it, and there were some uh, um, journalists from Boston who really found a lot of interest in this and um, had gone to the base and interviewed a, a ton of the witnesses. Yeah. Um, you know, so it didn't go unnoticed at the time. The fanfare of it has certainly faded away, but it was like to this day, talking to people in Northern Maine. Um, who who were connected to the base? They'll be like, oh yeah, there's always weird stuff that happened up there, you know. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. And it it just always seems like these things happen with low population, like mm. you know what I mean, like up in Maine in the desert, you know, over military bases, and it almost is like, I mean, it it, it whatever that is, if it's military or extraterrestrial, it is it choosing, like. <laughs> well, if it's, it if it's not, you know, if like you're saying, it's, I don't know, some sort of recon device or right. individual, I mean, they're, they're probably not looking to get noticed. Um, right. So, which, but then why, you know, why have, why have these things been heard about like over mili- uh, over war zones? Yeah. That, that one's interesting. Yeah. You were, you were telling me about that. We were talking about this like months ago. The, the one, was it in Kuwait or? the the orb it, it's got a name i don't know if you know about this nomar but um there was I've a heard of some of them but i don't know about this specifically yeah it was i'm, I'm trying to prompt you to remember i've it, told you a lot of weird yeah stories, we've, so we've talked about it. a lot of weird stuff but i remember we watched a video maybe uh in post we can find the video and play it um but uh it's a similar kind of shape to what you're describing that kind of like football shaped oh, sure. um although this one uh, in the, in the video, it looks kind of more like this chrome ball. Do you remember this now? Is it sounding familiar? I but, think so. Yeah, but so we, we, um, it, like you're saying, sighted over a war zone and moving very, very fast. Uh, yeah. Um, and yeah, that's well. They they've had them for um, for years over in uh, Southern California near the air bases. Um, really, they've seen these objects up in the air, and it's they're caught on uh, their radar systems. They're seen by the pilots. Um, and they're they're near military bases, so it's 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 interesting to think that like, it, it could there be two truths to that, right? Could it be uh, something that is not from our planet and it's uh, observing what our crazy <laughs> race of <laughs> creatures is doing, um, or could it be uh, you know military observing situations, collecting data? Um, the weirdest things that I've heard about the ones that are, that go into the ocean. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, we haven't really explored the ocean that, that much. So could something be in, in the water and that would make perfect sense. Cause we, th- yeah. I mean, we can't really see into the water. I mean, they could, <clears throat> you know, we can only, yeah. I mean, the Titanic took a hundred yeah. years to find, right. And they knew where it sank. Um, so I don't know. It's just wild. Yeah. It's wild to think yeah. about, but um, I love the uh, the idea that um, it's it's from another planet. It's from another galaxy. I, I like that idea. Uh, I'm more on this side that it probably is military, but it's just so strange. Like how, like even if you go back to the 19, you know, 30s, late 30s, when like you know, fast 50s, fast aircrafts, jet engines, like uh, the the stealth bomber, like yeah. even seeing those at that time, you'd be like. What? Like, especially someone yeah. born in like the 1880s, like right, they didn't right. even know what a, you know, a plane was just being kind of created. And to think like, is it possible yeah. that the technology is so insane right now that just the common person doesn't know it and, yeah. and can't experience it? I don't, I don't know. Be. I mean, yeah, one of the I, first U of O sightings happened in New Hampshire, I'm pretty yeah. sure, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, geez. And I think also... Uh, like off the, uh, the the bay of like Massachusetts, like we're we're talking like 1600s type of 
scenario. Really? Yeah, and I can't even remember the gentleman's name. I'm sure his like first name is John because yeah, you know, <laughs> he's a bad guy. but uh, but yeah, it was 1659, something like that. But there, it happened in Massachusetts area, and you know, reading the 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 captain's log or you know whatever it was documented in, uh, they're talking about it in like like a meteorite type of sense, you know, like this you know ball of light type of thing but it the way it was described is not you know meteor or celestial any in any way you know like hovering and yeah. you know so it, it goes the phenomenon goes back quite quite far you know? yeah and uh it's it's really interesting with the the remote areas uh where these sightings aren't happening and in military bases like you were saying earlier like i think that's by our design we're putting, you know, nuclear sites mm -hmm. in more remote areas. Yeah. You know, and That's a good point. Yeah. The UFOs are finding them or yeah. checking them out. And that appears to be, you know, a common thread. If there's nuclear aspect to a military base, that's where UFOs are seen. And Loring during those times did have nuclear weapons. On there you go. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Wow. So do you think that um today's technology is like back engineered from like things that we have found crash sites it's it, it's like anything the the one thing i've been doing this for 20 years now or probably longer i always say 20 years and i've been saying that for a while now <laughs> so it's probably longer but anyway um the only thing i'm sure of is that i i don't know anything there's way more questions than answers as soon as i hear somebody call themselves an expert that's when i stop listening <laughs> and like i don't know is it possible what you just posed to me yeah of course it's possible that we back engineered stuff there's the whole bob lazar thing whether you believe that or not i'm not a believer of it but i kind of go back and forth <laughs> with it but, uh, but as of right now, I'm not a Bob Lazar believer. But anyways, he has purported that a lot of stuff have been back engineered. Yeah. And that's where a lot of that comes from and just how it bleeds into, you know, our culture. You can kind of pinpoint it to one guy as Bob Lazar and yeah. how that went nuts for a while. We didn't even know his name for like 10 years. Really? I don't actually know anything about Okay, I was going to ask if you did know anything. Oh, yeah. um, he was a, a government uh, agent, CIA, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, he... uh, I don't know if it was CIA, but he worked at Area 51. And, yeah. Okay. You know, and, and he was the big Area 51 whistleblower. Gotcha, okay. So it wasn't a secret that there was a military base in the desert. Sure. But nobody knew what its name was, and the government didn't admit that it was there. So that's weird. And I think this Bob Lazar guy kind of jumped in on that. And then you have George Knapp, who I love George Knapp, but now he's kind of associated with Jeremy Corbell, and that's a whole pseudo thing that I'm not a fan of, which is too bad because George, uh, George Knapp has this amazing legacy, but I think it's getting a little bit tainted now. But again, this is all just my opinion, not the opinion of the show. <laughs> but... Um, uh, just to protect you guys a bit. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But, uh, uh, you know, are things back engineered? Are things uh, solely military or solely UFO? Like, all of it's possible. And yeah. I'm just here. Like, I'm done with disclosure and Stephen Greer's BS and, you know, all this stuff. I, I'm done with it all. I just want to talk to the experiencer who is having a hard time getting through their day because they're living with the fact that when they go to bed, they're, they're scared because they don't want to be taken again or whatever they feel is happening to them. So if I can be a kind, non-judgmental ear for them, you know, and, 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 and so they don't feel so crazy, that's what I want to be for them. And I also let them know that there might be other people like you that can't come forward or, you know, they, 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 they just can't. They won't do it. They refuse to do it. But they might read something in my book or they might hear something on my podcast or watch something that I do and they can relate to it and maybe not feel so alone. So that's where like I've been for like the last five, seven years, you know, with all of this research and stuff. I just I want to talk to the experiencer and make sure the person is OK. The world is nuts <laughs> enough, you know, as it is right now. So. If we can just be like human with each other with a very non-human thing that is going on, you know, that's that's what I want to be. That's where I want to be and that's what I want to do. So Totally. 
do you think um because I, I i'm on the agreement that you know the the human experience is is so important i believe that people yeah. when they see these things or experience these things i do believe that they experience them or feel them whether or not it actually happened that outside way. like in a in a you know someone else could see that they've got taken into a, a ship ship went up and then you know which and, has which has happened yeah, right right in some of their defense people have observed an abduction yeah. like a third party like chilling yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know but but it, it, you know the individual story i i still believe that like you know if something if you see something and and it's it's weird enough to make you think then why why are you you know why oh i can't you believe that you possibly saw something like that i mean i i believe yeah. that you really did you know I, I, yeah yeah and and like my motto and i even tell this to people that uh, i'll interview is it, i i i don't tell this to everyone but uh, most of the people that I talk to, I believe that you believe it. And right. sometimes that just has to be enough, right. uh, you know, and, and sometimes I will directly believe you and sometimes I won't. And it's not my job to be, be like a jerk to that person or show them, you know, to slight them in some way because I don't believe it. But if they're sincere, just like how you were when I told you my childhood story, you're like, that's believable. Cool. You weren't a jerk. You weren't like, that's crazy, <laughs> man. Like you're not. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so if I can, you know, do that for people or if people could do that for each other, you know, like I try to associate myself with people that are doing that for other people as well, you know, and so that's, that's a, a big part of it for me, you know. Yeah. And I can tell you're a really kind, empathetic guy. And I'm sure that that comes across as an interviewer, too. And that's a really having that uh, empathy that you're describing is really, I, I think, uh, really important when interviewing people. Um I want to get Roxy in on the convo if you if you want to. Roxy, uh, tell me about uh, I don't know a UFO or something. <laughs> tell you about a UFO or something. So in 2017 in Lemonster, Massachusetts, I actually spoke at the New England UFO conference, and I met a gentleman. He was an older gentleman um, who had actually worked at Loring up in Maine, oh, cool. and he was explaining all of the experiences that he had when he was up there, and he even went to the links to tell me of the processes and procedures that he said that they had in place when they encountered the UFO. And he gave me at least 10 in this, again, from his, his, his word. So I believe what he had said, um, he said he had over 10 experiences with wow. actually seeing them out on the runway. And he had worked there, you know, for, for well over 20 years. And again, he was, you know, probably at the time when I spoke to him in his late seventies. Um, and you couldn't convince him that he didn't have these experiences and that there wasn't a standard procedure in place, and that there were others that witnessed it as well. So, you know, much like you know, Mar, I talk to people that have stories all the time about all sorts of things, usually on the ghostly side of things. But um, he was so sincere and so detail oriented and didn't miss a beat when he explained his experiences, you know, right, right on down to the weather and everything. Um, there was there was no way I was going to say to him, you know, well, are you sure you really experienced that? Um, he he believed it, so I believed him. Um, yeah. And and we were in that sort of space with all sorts of people that were talking about that experience. And he says, you know, I don't tell everybody because I don't think everybody is going to believe me. But you know, it has become known as a place with a lot of experiences. So. Um, I think, you know, certainly what, what you do, Nomar, and, you know, congratulations on the anniversary of your book as well. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, does give people a, a comfort to know that there's someone out there that they can talk to or someone that they understand. So um, I don't run across it all the time because I'm more on the, the ghostly spiritual side of things, but it is something that is in the unknown. Um, and I find that, you know, sometimes you can't doubt somebody's experience you know when when they're so sincere about it yeah. um and my side of it is why would they why would a gentleman like this make it up um, yeah. so totally. yeah I've, I've certainly talked to my share of folks where i'm like okay you're making this up <laughs> but it's 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 a different kind of person really you know or uh -huh. you can almost sense their intention you know yeah. it's interesting uh, just not on an expert level of you know being a uh you know a, a micro um language uh, a micro movement uh 
you know, no training on that whatsoever. You just get feelings about people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I got to say, those are more rare than the sincere people. You know, sincere people come to me because, or sincere people come to people like Roxy and other associates that we have because they, they can tell or they know or they've heard that we're the right kind of person to talk to about this stuff. You're just going to get a nodding head. And God, thank you so much for sharing that, you know, with me. And, are you okay? You know, is, is everything all right? And, and I'm sure Roxy has them, but I have uh, people in my uh, uh, repertoire that I can, you know, uh, uh, refer someone to, you know, if someone wants to, if someone's into maybe being hypnotized or wants a support group or would maybe like some sort of empathic or mediumship um, uh, situation to, to talk through, you know, there's a lot of people that we can refer these people to. And they also hold these types of stories in the same high regard you know so everyone's treated you know with kindness across the board and if we can kind of keep that loop going you know for everybody we can we come in contact with you know I, I i really hope it's a big part of why more people are coming forward these days you know as opposed to not so yeah i mean you think it would be hopefully that's why yeah absolutely do you, do you have any specific uh support groups that you'd want to mention uh, yeah, there's there's one I, I don't mind mentioning. It's uh, Granite Sky Services. It's out of New Hampshire, and it's run by a gentleman named Mike Stevens. Uh, I believe at this point in time, they have monthly meetings that are in person. And you can find Granite Sky Services on Facebook. Just do a, a Facebook search for Granite Sky Services. It'll come right up, and you can see when their next meeting is. Again, they're typically in person, and people kind of sit in a circle, and they share what's happened to them or the latest thing or the first thing or you don't have to share it all you know it's, it's about being in a place of acceptance so yeah and that's actually so that's a good question for you because you've I mean talked to a lot of people who've had these experiences yeah. um, how many would you say what what's the amount of those people who have repeat experiences oh geez um, more than 50% yeah yeah and like is that like another like two times or is this like this is something that happens once and then follows them throughout their life typically i would say um more than two less than follows them their whole life yeah so it's typically multiple experiences and they might not remember everything mm -hmm. um some experiencers that i've talked to that have had lifelong encounters didn't start remembering them until their 20s or 30s or you know something to that effect yeah and uh, others uh, remember something really young and then something recent. And then it's through my questioning when they're, they're like, you know what, back in 91, this might have been something, you know, <laughs> because it, it was so weird, but they could, they could uh, you know, not think about it in the moment. Or yeah. It's like a screen right? memory might have happened or something, you know, to make them forget. Often um, uh, trauma victims forget a lot. Yeah, yeah uh, for, sure, for sure. Certainly. I mean, if you see something that's really that wild and you're like, what? Right. You and and not out. even like, because the people I'm talking to, they're like encountering beings, you know, and oh, they feel really? as though they're on board something or they're in a room with something, whether it's on board or not. They feel like they're in a room with something. And sometimes they remember the beginning and the end of it, but not the middle stuff. And if they want help with the middle stuff, you know, I, I can point them in a direction, but that's, you know, up to them and, and at their warning and discretion, you know. But uh, uh, this one woman that uh, I had the pleasure of interviewing, uh, 92 years old. Wow. And that's the only experience she can remember. Really? Lying in bed. She's not bedridden, but she's was definitely quite older and was on a lot of medication and needed like almost 24 hour, not supervision, but somebody around yeah. type of scenario. And she said she had woken up in the middle of the night and there were three tall beans around her bed. And in talking to her kids, they're like, this woman has no sense of humor. This, this woman doesn't make things up. She's a hardworking woman her whole life. She's kind of mean to be honest <laughs> with you. Okay, <laughs> you know, they're trying to, paint a picture for me so i understand you know the 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 you know how big of a deal this is that she is saying this information to me yeah 
three tall humanoids around her bed. Um, to her, she's perceiving them as doctors. I don't know if it's because of what they're wearing or what, but she's perceiving them as doctor-like. And she says that she is lifted out of her bed. They don't lift her, but she is like the three of them. Because of the three of them, she is lifted out of her bed and walked through her home and out the sliding glass doors of her that leads to the backyard. And she's put on a bus. She's sitting on this bus now and there's a lot of other people on the bus and everybody's kind of excited like a big trip is happening almost she was liking it to like maybe they're about to take a trip to like disneyland or something yeah. and everybody was just like anticipating something fun happening the next thing she remembers is being brought back through the glass door you know the sliding glass door being placed back in her bed and they left wild so that's all she remembers and she ended up living like i think another 10 years she died at like 102 or something wow 203 oh, something crap. like that that's crazy yeah yeah it was a wild wild story oh my god wow well nomar thank you so much for uh taking the time to talk to us today um we do yeah. kind of have to wrap up here but so where sure. can people reach I you just, i just want to throw in a quick footnote oh go for it Roxy. Wrap up. um so that first ufo experience that happened in massachusetts it was governor winthrop and it dates back to 1644 nice. and he wrote it in his journals at the time um he was in the charles river and him and a whole bunch of people saw what they couldn't identify at the time so that was the first documented ufo sighting um in in the colonies in new england so wow. if you want to awesome. add that to your homework list as well as nomar's book um it goes back to 1644 so i just wanted to put in that footnote in case awesome. uh, anybody wanted to check it governor out governor winthrop thank you roxy thank you. All right, yeah, Nomar, any uh, uh, shout out, shout out, social media? Where can people yeah, reach you? Where can sure. they find your book? Uh, if Books, you do, plural. my name is so unique. Uh, you can do a Google search for Nomar Slebic, and all my stuff will come up. You can buy my books on Amazon, Kindle, and all that stuff. But I prefer the mom and pops, and I have a mom and pop online store, if you cool. will. So you can go to slebicstore.company.site, get the book directly from me, or the Green Hand Bookshop in Portland, Maine. Just do a Google search for them; they'll come right up, and you can get my stuff over there. And if you go in, tell Michelle we said hi. She's awesome. So <laughs> awesome. But yeah, that's about sweet. It. All righty. Well, um, we don't really have an outro for this. Uh, well, I mean, we have uh, one minute left. Uh, um, oh, do we? Yeah. Oh, um, my, my eyes are bad. I can. No, I that's okay. Um, we we'd love to have you back on if you you're willing. Um, yeah, of we course. could do a similar uh, um, Zoom call. And everything yeah, like that, so. we didn't get to it in this one, but I I don't know it, how well you know the Betty and Benny Hill story. Um, oh, Betty and Barney. Betty and Barney. Okay, my bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but that's the the um, the UFO or first yeah, abduction that. thing in New Hampshire. Yeah. So we should love to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, we should we should do this again and and talk about that and uh, and a few other things. Yeah, totally. Awesome. The great. Exeter incident. Yeah, Is that what it's exactly. called? The Exeter incident. Awesome. Yeah. That, that's another one. But yeah. Oh, okay. It's a separate one. And that There's involved a lot, the police. Yeah. You know. So. Oh yeah, my God. That's, that's a great one to talk about too. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll delve uh, into that right. next time. All righty. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. And we're out.